Hello, my name is Peter Harrop, Chairman of ID TechX. I'm going to interview this time someone from Switzerland. It's Michael Lamperth of Five Power, who, if I could say so, is a guru of the motor industry. I think you go back quite a way, is that right? Uh, I do go back quite a by the way, if I'm a guru, I don't think so. <laughs> <laughs> well, I heard your talk, so I'll, I'll have the advantage of saying yes, I think you are. Thanks Absolutely very much. fascinating talk just now. And I'd like to ask you about, uh, first of all, the business you have. I mean, what's the twinkle in your eye? What are you trying to do in commercial terms? So we're trying to bring the axial flux technology uh, into a an, an market where we can produce. Uh, at the right cost because it's no good to have the best motor if nobody can afford to buy it or nobody wants to buy it. So we're trying to, to get that compromise right of production cost, lowering production cost, keeping the performance where it needs to be, not where it could be, and combining that with innovation to achieve that. And point. the focus is electric vehicles or generally? or The focus is, is generally. So we're at the moment where we're really active is anything but uh, high volume cars because we don't believe that a company like us can supply these. So we do have some OEM work that's going on but we will consider licensing them. And you pointed that interestingly out and rightly out in your, in your presentation that a big part of the automotive market in terms of motors will be OEM work. They don't want to buy them in from suppliers. Yeah, yeah, so we, yeah, we, yeah, yeah. we know that. And so yeah. our strategy is to to go uh, and be able to supply that need for them. Ah, so you're virtual, like a virtual extension of a company. Uh, maybe sometimes you will help them to perfect what they want, and you would produce it in what quantities would you be now, comfortable uh, with? At this moment, uh, we are comfortable in the, in the hundreds. Yeah. Probably now in the low thousands. Yeah. Uh, for higher volumes, we uh, work very actively in partnerships with established manufacturers of yeah. electric machines that might not have the innovation that we bring. Right, right. And then for automotive volumes, we, as I said, looking at licensing. And your sweet spot in terms of size of motors, I mean, there are very large axial motors and extremely small ones, but your comfort zone in terms of production would be what sort of size? So from at this moment we start at about 20 kilowatts and go up to just under a megawatt. Oh really? But, wow. Uh, the, the real sweet spot I think for us at the moment is 50 kilowatts to 200 kilowatts continuous per slice or per core and then if you have two or three cores you, you can bring it up. Yes, yes, of course, uh, yes, yes. But we see a clear uh, push towards larger machines, yeah. uh, truck applications, uh, working machinery, diggers, etc. Where yes. high torque, low speed is needed. And well, axial, absolutely. Axial plays a very yes, of important course. role. No, no, absolutely. I, I, uh, one of our best-selling reports is uh, for the um, uh, construction, agriculture and mining um, uh, electric vehicles, which is going to be a much bigger business than two-wheelers and all those things. And um, I was quite surprised actually going to interview the board of JCB, the digger people and all the rest and look at their products. They don't actually have crazy power. They, the smaller ones, you know, a small digger or a... Uh, um, a, a small loader or whatever it is um, uh, they're often the sort of motors you're describing and they'd be the sort of volumes you're describing so I'm not surprised that you you got there ahead of me or uh, <laughs> there are a lot of emerging electrification projects which require your speed sweet spot it, it, yes. it's not by no means on road all the time. Absolutely. And, and it's electric aircraft, it's electric aircraft, that's the, those quantities. Mm. Exactly, so in terms of our, yeah, we sell quite a lot into, into the working and digging machineries at 60 to 80 kilowatts, 2500 to 2800 RPM, because it fits the, the engineering or the technologies that are there, the gears that they have, etc. what they're used to, so that's very, very important market to us. Um, interestingly, aircraft have similar speeds when you 
when you mentioned yes, them. Yes, um, yeah, yeah, yeah. That's an area very active in, but very cautious. Yes, well, I think I'm George Bai is going to wake up that whole industry. Mm. We, we've had certain things where I think um, very excitingly certain companies the fact that George Buy has orders for 1,100 aircraft at probably an average price of $300,000, $350,000, even a large company can't ignore that. That is obviously a great success. It's not a joke, it's not a hobby, it's a serious prospect. And that's just beginning, that's in only about a year. And you've got a similar thing with the solar cars, with Sonomotor Scion cars in Germany, where to be honest, I think the big car companies should be blushing right now because they've got a, a equivalent order book. You know, everyone laughed at solar cars and having high efficiency motors and making the, the vehicle um, modern in every respect. But um, they, they've got very considerable orders for those and, and you can see that all over the place. Uh, and um, I wanted to ask you as an next question really, given this wealth of opportunity you have, you have enormous different applications, land, water, air, and so on. Uh, of all the uh, advantages you described, in your talk you were very balanced, you talked of disadvantages as well, which was very much appreciated, I think, by the audience. Uh, but with the advantages, there are a whole string of advantages, maybe a measure of flywheel action, maybe the fact that it's very pancake shape and maybe the fact that it's very high kilowatts per kilogram and its efficiency might not necessarily be the best in all circumstances but it's pretty good and so on. Um, what are the primary um, benefits that read on to the markets you're interested in? What's the first thing you say when you come in the room? <laughs> Essentially, sh show me your system. Yeah. And, and it, a lot of it plays then into what is the space that's available. Yeah. And, yeah. and then when that is favorable to the axial flux technology, then we're at a good start. So we're not trying to go and sell some of our products into applications where other technology might be more cost effective, if you're honest about it. So what we're trying to do is, is literally come in and, and state that we're not here just to sell a motor, but we're here to understand your, your system and we'll try to contribute to that system in the best possible way. And hopefully it's going to be an axial machine that helps, but not, then uh, we will communicate it as well. And by now, obviously customers come to us when they know we have a problem with length or we have a problem with extreme uh, torque, torque densities or power densities. So that would be um, near-wheel motors, in-wheel motors, aircraft motors. They obviously benefit from what I rudely call the pancake shape, but it's, you know, the flatter shape. Yours is not the flattest shape for very good reasons, uh, but it still is a, that type of form factor is, is enormously beneficial. And, and those are trends. I mean, the trends to near-wheel, the trend to in-wheel, the trends to electric aircraft and so on. Um, but um, let, let me try to be balanced. Um, I mentioned in my talk a concern in the industry about permanent magnets. Permanent magnets have a disadvantage, obviously, of overheating and you've ruined your motor. Um, and um, above all, there's the supply issue, which is, was terrible a few years ago, then it went away. Um, and so the approach of some people like Tesla um, part of their rationale, I think, in, in having their um, permanent magnet synchronous motor is that you have permanent magnets, but not much, they're, they're less. Uh, it's not just that they get much more efficiency than their asynchron asynchronous motor. I, I think they have said we are keeping an eye on this vulnerability of having very big permanent magnets. Are there equivalent things you can do with your technologies? Uh, absolutely. There are? And, and yeah. Oh. In a sense, I was going to say, watch this space, what happens in the next few months, oh. or probably a better years. So for mm. us, this is a, a huge topic. Yeah. Because uh, at Evo Electric, we had this, uh, we lived through the hike spike in pricing, yeah. which nearly, uh, which cost us an awful lot. 
uh, in terms of business. And even now, yes, we, we seem to have forgotten the problem. Uh, for us, uh, there's many reasons why we want to reduce magnets or if possible even eliminate magnets. So we do have research that is going on a sort of constant basis and the background where we're working on these oh. toppings oh. to reduce magnets because... Oh, great. <laughs> How many of you at the moment in your startup? Your, your we latest. are small. Yeah. We are small. Yeah. It's, yeah. it's about six yeah. people that, yeah. great. that are working. Yeah. And we can do that with a, because we've got a superb supply chain around us so that most things we buy in yeah, yeah. and well, assemble or have built for us. That's but what so many others are doing yeah. very successfully. You don't have to have a large team. Yes. As long as you have really high quality people and you know the high quality people, yes. Yes. And I think that's a business model that's very powerful. Yes, that's very true. So, um, why are you in Switzerland? Because Switzerland is home. And, uh, I mean, Evo Electric was, was founded uh, in England when I was a, a lecturer at Imperial College. Oh. And this is why it was in there. Oh. Um, <coughs> was in the UK, it was in Woking because this is where I lived and oh. uh, it was, was a, a, a good area to put a company in. Also, we were actually more or less in the same campus with McLaren. Oh. Uh, so that was the reason there, but then at some stage we, we yeah. went back as a, as a family. Uh, mm. I was still working for Evo then and yes. actually commuted right. more or less mm. uh, once and every week, two weeks or so. Uh, and obviously when Evo Electric was essentially um, absorbed into GKN, it was time for me to to leave. Yeah. And I was living in Switzerland. Yeah. I thought about an academic career, and then realized actually there is too much potential in this technology. Um, having a company that is really engineering focused, high quality development and research work combined with supply uh, was a better way than just going back to academia. Mm. Mm. And your funding. And, uh, at this moment, we are customer funded, so we are... Uh, oh, right. excellent. Good. And um, you are involved in the controllers? Uh, yes and no. Uh, we have a very good relationship with Cascadia Motion. And so we are supplying a lot of our motors with Cascadia Motion controllers. This is, it's a long, I mean, more than a decade that we're working together. Uh, personal relationship. We were actually just last week together on the Professional Motorsport World Expo. They invited us on their stand, so they're a very important partner from us, yes. for us. Please say the name again. Cascadia Motion. Ah, yes. Yeah. Yes. Yes. So, and it has to be said that the motors per se, as long as they're with permanent magnets, they're simple to control. So it doesn't, it doesn't need to be a Cascadia Motion inverter. Uh, because they're just surface mount permanent magnet machines equivalent so you there's many other options as well but that partnership is is very strong to oh, well, excellent and and sometimes you may be integrating a product if there's in in the same yes. housing or something yeah. like that there's some yes. trend to that and uh, what about um, um, integrating other things I suppose it's it's too far out of your business plan to go to do a complete in-wheel motor or something. That means disc brakes. That means all manner of other things, doesn't it? Yes. Yeah, so we yeah. wouldn't do that. We've been asked to do that. Mm. Uh, what we do very actively at the moment is, is integrated uh, hybrid modules, P1 and P2 modules, yeah. for uh, aftermarket customers like just around here. Yeah. Uh, or OEMs. Yeah. So that's uh, an integration part that we're doing. Uh, very often. Yeah. What do you think is the main gap in the market for the future of electric vehicle motors, man, water and air vehicles? Um, what, what's, what's, it, it, it's a, you wouldn't tell me, go on. <laughs> <laughs> Essentially, I mean, it's a difficult question on one side because the gap is created by what the market wants. Yes, uh, and and sometimes at the moment it's uh, it's difficult to see where the market goes because it's yes. it's it's exploding and there's so many yes. directions that people are pulling. Yeah, and um, to us it's yeah. surreal that uh, we we we've done a report on um, electric motors for electric vehicles. We've done it every year for ten or twelve years now, 
and it sells very well because uh, that's the only thing that every electric vehicle has by definition. I mean, it doesn't have to have a battery, it might have a supercapacitor. It's still an electric vehicle, but it has to have a motor, it has to have a traction motor. And so people are very interested in all that. And it has been quite surreal in a way because as we gradually every year keep counting how many people are making, uh, tra let's call them traction motors, um, it's at least 200 companies. And yet we keep doing interviews with um, vehicle manufacturers who say out of those 200, none of them will do what I want. Uh, and I don't know any other industry like it, you know, because as you heard in my talk, I was saying uh, right speed and zero motorcycles and uh, light year. And it's a long list of even startups who say, I can't get what I want. And it's not because the motor companies are sort of arrogant and say, well, unless you give me an order for a million, I won't talk to you. It's not that problem. Startups no. often have that problem. It's not that problem. They know exactly what they want. They want to eliminate water cooling or, you know, a motorcycle has to have superb acceleration or it's not a motorcycle. And they just can't get what they want. And, and uh, it, it's amazing with zero motorcycles near here. They've exhibited here before. and. We know them well, and, and they, they said uh, what we were able to do, not as motor people, but by trying to get our minds around it, um, by redesigning a permanent magnet motor, we've ended up with eliminating water cooling and getting better acceleration. And you wouldn't think the experts can't do it, and they can. I mean, it's a dilemma for us as analysts to explain yeah. how can the world be like that? <laughs> uh, to, be, to be honest, I don't think it is. Indeed. I Man, think really. uh, there is a big problem that we see uh, that when people come to us, depending also on their experience, they have sometimes unrealistic ex expectations. They want a motor that weighs nothing, has no size, uh, but has megawatts of power and yep, costs yep, nothing. Yep, yep. That's, that's a bit yeah, too harsh, but essentially yes, the expectations yes, are, yes, are too, yes. too high. And when we tell them, you know, we can only offer you yeah. this because what you want, mm. we cannot do, mm. uh, then quite often uh, they decide, yeah, we want to go somewhere else where somebody else says, yes, we can do what you want. Or, or they might believe themselves that they can do what they want. And I have seen various projects where we've been involved and said, we can't do it like that. We can offer you something else, but what you want is now you know, possible. Um, and later on, when we saw the product that came out, it was actually bigger than what we have proposed. But sometimes uh, that's, that's what happens if you're, if you're too honest up front. Now, with regards to, um, to zero, I mean, beating acceleration and putting air on, I don't think, uh, putting air cooling in, I don't think is a contradiction because the acceleration that they get is, is not really uh, a factor of the air or water cooling because the heat will be absorbed into the thermal mass of the motor and then released later on. So I think, um, yeah, they don't contradict themselves. What you get is a bigger uh, ratio between constant output and peak power output uh, with, with an air-cooled machine. So our, our machines, when we do air-cooled, we, we usually give the same peak performance, uh, but for a much shorter time. And, and we just need to communicate to people that, yeah, you, yes, you put yes. the heat into, into the motor, you get it out. Yes, yes. And so I, th I think, and with a lot of respect for, for Ciro, yeah. because I like it when people go with, and do what they believe in, Yes, their yes. motor is. There are other motors on the market that are probably better than theirs for that application. For that application, all oh, right. But um, yeah, because it I is interesting. I, I wouldn't labour the point. I mean, I wasn't saying what they're claiming is inconsistent. What I was really saying was, um, I don't know of any other serious motorcycle that has dispensed with liquid cooling, whereas they have. And they are number one making several thousand a year. It's not a huge business, but clearly the product works, so they wouldn't be number one. Uh, and so 
it, 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 it's just interesting that that story is being retold with a number of other things. I think, for instance, if we move to in-wheel motors, which is very relevant to axial flux, one of your primary skills, um, I've interviewed many times ELAF in Slovenia, and I've interviewed many times Protean in the UK, and um, I say to them, well, how come that, you know, Nightshear, having talked to all of you, has said, um, not good enough, we design our own. And they make one point which, which is interesting. They, they feel that, yes, perhaps by going axial flux, whereas they're radial flux, for different reasons, for lower cost components and their own arguments, and that it's not black and white. Um, but in that situation, they feel that a startup like Lightyear might be initially making its own motor, motors, it is, um, and they do perform very well. Um, but when it needs volume production, it's then going to have to talk to people, well, perhaps like you, indeed, like, uh, certainly like them. Uh, you'd have the advantage because you're already an expert in axial flux and they would insist they want axial flux because they, they want to have exceptionally good vehicle efficiency at vehicle level uh, that comes from in wheels, small size, all those things, not just the percentage operational efficiency of the motor. And uh, ELAF and um, uh, Protean are using um, radial flux technology that isn't as thin. Um, but um, it, it, it's interesting. So that I found your talk absolutely fascinating. Yeah. And uh, I'm you... talking too much. And uh, <laughs> yeah, yeah, actually, I would well, yeah. listen to you. But thank you. I mean, I was just I was also going back to zero for a for yes. a second. Uh, because if you look at a Saroleo motorcycle, you'll have a motorcycle that has a superb performance and is an air-cooled motor in there. You might not know oh, that. Oh, is it? I, I didn't know that. The Sirocco? Sarolea. Oh, Sarolea. Yeah. Oh. Uh, it's a high-performance motorbike. I didn't motorbike. know that. That's interesting. And, uh, so it's, yeah. It's, yeah. Oh, good. Well, so, good luck to you. Wonderful. So yeah. they're doing that. And, and if, if you were going to... Um, guess where you would be in a few years time where your biggest orders would be in terms of type of vehicle uh, would it be industrial type vehicles you guess at this time rather than on-road vehicles or would it be aircraft I mean a hard question yeah I mean it does twist and turn don't we but what do you think industrial is definitely going to be at the top there ah. also because we, we have existing um, supply agreements for uh, industrial vehicles and, and, and contracts in place and we know how that market develops and yeah, we know yeah, that yeah. That's, uh, yeah, it's growing faster than they predicted it, it yeah. would. Yeah. So that's going to be very, very important for us. Interesting and one that we found is um, we've done reports on in agricultural robotics and uh, because the uh, weed killers don't work anymore. That it, mo most of the time, the plant weeds are resistant now. So the poisons, a, you, uh, the world doesn't tolerate poisons as much being put into the water supply, and and b, they don't work usually now. So you have to do robot weeding, mechanical weeding. Uh, there's some that claim to beat the weeds to death, which sounds funny. Ooh. Uh, and there are others that um, more often have got a sort of pantograph arrangement pulling weeds out at high speed and dropping them on the ground. Uh, but one way or the other, a number of them are solar, so they don't need to plug in. They just go slowly and they work when it's daylight. doesn't matter when they work as long as they do the job. And they should be very low cost because then you can buy a thousand if, if you're not doing enough in your fields automatically. And these things just do what they do when they can. But we're describing a world where the whole vehicle, including its motors, has to be lightweight because one of the great benefits of that sort of treatment, including for um, actually putting in seeds and, and surveying humidity and all the clever things the robots, different robots do, is they don't compact the soil. At the moment, the big vehicles compact the soil, you can't grow anything in it. And so they're, they're wonderful. So suddenly you're talking about the exact opposite of your incredibly heavy tractor and hoe and everything. And you do need that for digging. But for these other, all these other functions, you're really, including the motors, want things that are low cost, lightweight. Maybe you can help with that. <laughs> uh, absolutely. What I see as, as a trend there is for direct drive, 
axial motors where we go very thin so our, our torque to weight ratio actually becomes exceedingly good so they're thin but quite large in diameter but the wheels have to be large anyway and so that's a, a solution where air cooled as well becomes possible for, for a good continuous uh, torque output. Given that these vehicles they don't move very fast, so you have you have a torque uh, demand requirement, not a power. Power is yeah. quite low. Yeah. yeah, as you said earlier. Yes. yes and so, yeah. and so I I see some motors there that look very more very different to or they really look disc yeah. motors. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Type where yeah. you essentially yeah play to the strengths of axial going. Yeah, absolutely. Fascinating. Well, thank you very much for your time. A pleasure. We'll talk to you forever, uh, but it's really very interesting. Value keeping in contact. And you're a wonderful excuse guys, to go to Switzerland. <laughs> yeah. Come and visit. Many excuses. <laughs> thank you very much. Thanks a lot. Thank you.